there are two different possibilities there. Um, the Masoretic text and the Targum say that he moved them into the cities, and the Samaritan Pentateuch, the uh, Septuagint and the Vulgate read he made them slaves. So your translation, whichever one you're reading, decided to go with the, the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, the Septuagint, and the Vulgate. Okay, now let's think about that for just a second. The Samaritan Pentateuch is an ancient copy of the five books of Moses. Okay, it's called the Samaritan Pentateuch, though, because it was found, it, it, it relates to Samaria. In other words, when uh, Israel was divided from uh, Judah, and you have the two di the divided kingdom after the time of King Solomon, their capital became Samaria. Jerusalem was the capital of the south. And so they amended their Pentateuch very minimally. It's almost identical to the Pentateuch that the Jewish people use, but they amended it to say that Samaria is the capital, not Jerusalem, etc. Okay, so th they made these changes to show that they are God's people and not Israel, uh, the, the, the Jewish Jerusalem thing. Okay, other than that, it is almost identical in all ways. Okay, now, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint Septa, meaning 70. So, 70 people translated it. It dates, are you leaving? Have a good time. We'll see you later. Um, the Septuagint predates Jesus. Okay, the uh, the uh, manuscript used by the Jesus quotes and the apostles quote the most is the Septuagint, not the Hebrew text, okay? So just so you know, this predates Jesus. It's a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And then the third one is the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate was translated by Jerome from the original Hebrew and the Greek text for the New Testament, okay? So... The chances are that if all three of those agree, the Samaritan Pentateuch, which only has changes relating to the, 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 you know, the people in the city, okay, if the Samaritan Pentateuch, if the Septuagint, which predates the uh, time of Jesus, and the Latin Vulgate, which was translated out of these ancient Hebrew texts, all agree, chances are that your translation is probably correct that he made them virtual slaves rather than he moved them into the cities, okay? Now, this is important to understand this because the other one, the Masoretic text, the oldest copy of the Masoretic text is about a thousand years after Jesus. And then the Targums are an Aramaic uh, a commentary on the Jewish texts, okay? And they are after the time of Jesus. So let's think about it. Why would it say he made them virtual slaves and this one say he moved them into the cities? Why would there be a difference between the two? Uh, culture at that time, they might not have understood what it implied if they moved them to the c cities. If he made them slaves, um, maybe the Masoretes were, were saying, by making them slaves, he necessarily moved them into the cities. So maybe they, they, they could have done that, but that would have still been changing the text. Right. Read okay. What, what that what the implication That's is. possible. What I would think, this is just me, what I would think it's even more blatant than that, that they didn't want to have the hero of the Bible making people slaves. And so they changed the text, the Masoretic text, because, do you see, they were slaves in Egypt. Joseph is enslaving the people of Egypt, and it's like, we don't want to acknowledge that. The Masoretic text usually deviates when it does some harm to the Jewish people, such as in the 22nd Psalm. 22nd Psalm clearly identifies Jesus. He, they pierced him in his hands and his feet. And yet the Masoretic text, which doesn't agree with any of the other ancient texts, says, like a lion, his hands and his feet. It makes no sense at all. It makes absolutely no sense at all. They amended, E-M-E-N-D-E-D, -E -E -D, they amended the text to read differently than they pierced his hands and his feet. And the reason why is because it was so obvious that this is pointing to Jesus that they don't, so they, they amended the text. So the Masoretic text is very, very reliable. Don't get me wrong. It's what the King James Version and New King James Version is based on. But it is apparent that they have changed it a little bit. If you go to the uh, suffering servant passages in um, Isaiah 53, 
Okay, in your text, the NIV and the, uh, the NASB and other translations will normally add in, and his soul shall see the light of life. But that's not in this, this part of the uh, uh, Isaiah 53. It's not in here, which is based on the Masoretic text. It leaves that out. Well, it makes no sense unless it's speaking of the resurrection. It makes no sense. That's the only connotation, and they knew that. Everything else they can say, well, this is pointing to the people of Israel, and it's, you know, they can make stuff up. They couldn't make up anything about this, so you just deleted it out entirely. How do we know that that belongs in there? Because it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which they found later, which predates the time of Jesus. And it doesn't match the Masoretic text, which is, uh, and the Masoretes would always destroy the text that they had translated from. So they only have their, their one text, okay? They put them over here and they, they, they destroy them. So there are corruptions in the Masoretic text, which, and I'm not, I, I don't want to say dogmatically that this one is wrong and that yours is right, but I would favor the NIV's rendering because it's based on the Samaritan Pentateuch, which is ancient, and it only has changes that don't pertain to this particular issue. It matches the Septuagint, which predates Jesus, and it matches the Latin Vulgate, which was translated from original Hebrew texts back at the time of Jerome in 300 A.D., and the Masoretic text is 1000 A.D. So there's 700 years difference. I think probably they, the Jewish people, did not want in their copy of their, uh, you know, their, their readings that Joseph enslaved people. That's why I think. Now, you could be right, but I have a feeling that it's more sinister than that. They just said, here, we were slaves, and our whole thing is we were brought out of slavery by Moses. And Joseph, So I don't mean to divert too far in this, but to me this is important, and I think it should be important to all of us is to know why there are differences in the Bible, and not to just read over them, but to really understand why they're in there, and that's why I think it is. Does anybody else have any other opinions on that? Because she had a good... A good thought on it. Just a guess. Yeah, it's just a guess, and mine is just a guess too. I've never done any study on this. I just, you know, whenever I've said this before, I don't normally read Bible commentaries. I'm reading a Bible commentary in the Bible I have now because Jim and Linda Dwyer gave me the Bible. It's the first time I'm reading it, and it's an apologetic study Bible, and so it defends certain things like the archaeology and stuff. So I'm reading it. But normally I don't read any Bible commentaries ever. But I read always the footnotes in the Bible to tell you the textual differences. Because if you read those, and they never explain those. Commentaries never explain these. It just says this word literally means or this word is translated out of this text, but this text says it's this way. I always want to know why, and I sit and I think about these things. Because it helps you understand why the book we're reading says what it says. Okay? So anyway, didn't mean to divert there. And then I had a point on verse 22 too. Oh, um, only the land of the priests he did not buy. For the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh, and they ate their rations which Pharaoh gave them, therefore they did not sell their lands. It's similar to the way the Hebrews did their priestly thing, and it's also different. The priests owned no land in Israel. Okay? The tribes were allotted an inheritance in Israel, but the Levites were allotted no inheritance. They were given cities to live in that were located in specific areas so that they could minister to the people. And then they were given a certain amount of land outside of the city, like a buffer zone, but they were not given a specific portion of land per person. And the, the, we'll say, we'll just use as an example the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin is given land and then it's divided up by clan and then by family and then by person. So this person, this is his land forever. And he works it and he gets grain, and he takes this grain, and he sells it, and he pays his tithe, and he does all of this other stuff. And the third year, the year of the tithe, is when they take care of the priests. Everything belongs to the priests in the third year. The first two years, they take their tithe and they eat it. Okay, it's their tithe. Okay, um, the priests didn't have that. They had no inheritance, and they had no way of making their own. Uh, uh, grain and their own harvest, so certain things were given to the priests to take care of them. The priests in Israel, as I said, every third year, the people of Israel gave away the tithe. Did you know that? You look confused about that. When you tithe, what we teach tithing in American churches is not at all what the Bible says. In the Bible, you, yeah, every third year you gave away your tithe. The first two years you ate your tithe. Have you ever heard anybody preach that? 
No, I just no. knew that if the first year coming into into the land of Canaan, there wasn't going to be enough for them. Well, that's right. In the initial first the, the initial years first years of coming in with Joshua, but I didn't know it was a perpetual perpetuals year. ordinance mandated by Moses, Deuteronomy fourteen, Deuteronomy twenty six, and Amos four four. They only gave away the third year tithe. Okay, so what you hear preached in American churches is it's it's wrong anyway. We're not supposed to be preaching tithing, but they misuse the tithe verses and they say you're supposed to give away ten percent every year. That's not that's not what the biblical standard says. So if you're gonna preach tithing, preach the truth about tithing, or don't preach fourteen twenty two is where it starts and it goes to the end of that chapter. Deuteronomy fourteen, starting with the twenty second verse, going down to the end of the chapter, and then Deuteronomy twenty six, verse twelve, in the third year, the year of the tithe, and then in Amos four four it says bring your tithes every third year. So those, it, it, the, the Bible's very clear about what tithing is supposed to be. American churches are not very clear on preaching it properly. Okay. Anyway, don't want to get into tithing again, but um, what I'm trying to show is that in that third year, everything was given to the widows, the orphans, and to the priests so that they would have food to last them for the three years. One other thing was given to the priests in Israel. Does anybody know what it was? They have the land, the cities they live in, which was theirs perpetually, okay? It was the skins of the sacrificial animals. When an animal was sacrificed, you actually, 99% of the sacrifices, you actually ate your own sacrifice also. So don't let people say, oh, they gave away 400% of what they made because they, no. They would take out a sacred portion and they would burn it on the altar and they'd give a, a certain portion, like a certain leg or whatever, to the priest and then they'd eat the rest of the sacrifice except for sin offerings. Sin offerings were completely burned on the altar because you didn't want to partake in your own sin, right? So it was a, a, a whole burnt offering. Okay, but the skins of these animals were given to the priests so that they use, use them for parchment, for writing, because they were the ones that, that maintained the law, and also they could use it for selling clothes, they could use it for making drums and all of these other things, so they had an income. So God was looking out for the priests, but in this one it says, um, only the land of the priests he did not buy. So they owned their own land. And they cultivated their own land. So you see there's a difference between the priestly class in Egypt. There's a similarity and there's a difference. They are separate, but here they have their own land. And they were given um, rations Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their lands. So they had their own lands. The Levites did not have their own lands. They had their own property, but not their own lands. Okay, It would be like me living in a city. I don't have a place where I can grow a farm. But the rest of the tribes would be given land where they could cultivate, you know, vines or whatever they wanted to use their land for, okay? So there is a difference, but there's a similarity, and uh, I just wanted to make that distinction so that when we get to those other verses, you'll know to look back to this verse and remember that. Okay, verse 23. And Joseph said to the people, <clears throat> Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is the seed for you, and you shall sow the land. Okay, so he is saying, I own this land and I'm going to give you seed, you are now going to grow your crops for us. And, you know, if they wanted to, because they're hungry, they could have eaten the seed, but then if their land doesn't produce, then it's probably their head. So Joseph really had this figured out very well. Okay, he really knew what he was doing as far as, as uh, how to... You know, and this was all God's prerogative. I mean, Egypt became a great nation because of it, and because they were a great nation... They now need slaves, so they enslave the people to build the things to show how great they are, right? You can see how everything winds together just like, uh, I, I, I hate the word because people use it so often, like a tapestry, but that's what it's like. Everything fits together so perfectly that when it's time to redeem Israel, they actually have to... They're fighting against the greatest power on earth because they own everything. They have all of this land. They have all the wealth of the slaves that have been building things for them and producing things for them. Okay? And then it shows the greatness of God above the greatness of Egypt. Okay? Everything just fits so beautifully. But go ahead. And at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh and your, your and four fifths shall be your own. So this is a mandate forever. He now owns the land and he gives them seed the first time and he says, what you grow. So not only 
are they not going to eat their own seed because, you know, but they are given an incentive to grow as much as possible. 